everybody knows, at least here in North America, Europe, as we enter into the holiday season, people get sick more often. You start to see the flu more often. You start to see uh, respiratory diseases, RSV, other things like that. But also, what I didn't know until I started following your work is that not only are those things spiking, and it might be for the reasons that you were never told about, which we're going to get into in a second, but you're also seeing an increase in overall deaths. And it's not because the holiday season, it's because of something else. Can you expand on that? So if you were to look at a graph of heart disease deaths or deaths due to heart disease, deaths due to cancer, deaths due to kidney disease, Alzheimer's disease, uh, respiratory disease, influenza, and the list goes on and on. You would see that they all go, come up together and they all peak about one to three weeks after the shortest day of the year. And they all continue to go back down again and keep going down until about one to three weeks after the longest day of the year, which is when those death rates are the lowest. And then they start to make their way back up. Essentially, the more sunlight is, is hitting that portion of the earth, the lower the death rates are for all of those causes, both infectious diseases, and non-infectious diseases. Can you contrast with, you know, so much of what we've been told? I remember always people telling us, it's like, oh, we're in close quarters and people yeah. are gathering for the holidays. But you contrast that with a place like Australia and you see something completely different. Can you chat about that? Yeah, so no question that when we are in closed spaces that we're more likely to spread the influenza virus, but that doesn't mean... Uh, that that doesn't make us more susceptible to influenza. That just means that it's spreading it around more. What's interesting about this is that at the very same time that we are gathering uh, uh, for Christmas and New Year's, the Australians are doing the very same thing. But the sun is down in the southern hemisphere. They're getting plenty of sunlight. And so you would expect that we would have a lot of influenza during that time. There is no influenza. It doesn't exist. We're, it's not even in the influenza season. Where we see influenza happening in the Southern Hemisphere is in June and July. That's when they get their influenza. So it's it's not necessarily these meetings that are happening. It's this. It's when the sun has pulled away enough that there is a a, a paucity of sunlight that a population a population's immunity seems to be opened up for infections and a flu season. Uh, just to, to sort of nail that home a little bit further, Singapore, which is only about 80 miles from the equator, if you look at their flu season, you'll find that there is actually no flu season. It just sort of jumps around in a random fashion. The sun never leaves Singapore long enough for there to actually be a flu season. So it just sort of happens at a particular steady rate throughout the entire year. So you can see here, if you just step back and look at the 30,000 foot level that you've asked us to do, you'll see that sunlight is just very, very uh, uh, effective at preventing a lot of these diseases. Now, there was a uh, it's hard to separate out cold air from lack of sunlight because that always happens in the wintertime. But there's an interesting thing that happens that will prove the point. In 2009, we had the H1N1 influenza pandemic. You may not have remembered it, but we, we had that. It went around the world. And that year, instead of in the Northern Hemisphere, instead of it arriving in October and November when it usually does, it actually came extremely early in April. And so we had the ability to decouple or to bifurcate this idea of influenza happening during a cold season versus influenza happening with sunlight. And so, because obviously in the 2009 H1N1 pandemic, it started in April, but it went right through the summer. And so the researchers at Harvard actually took a look at that year and many other years looking at solar radiation data. And they looked at the CDC index and they were able to plot out based on solar radiation data, which is not just latitude, it's actually particularly what parts of the country in the United States actually get more sunlight. And that has a lot to do with cloud cover, mountain ranges, things of that nature. But they were able to get it down to that minute of a level and look at actual solar radiation data. And their conclusion was, and, and I'm quoting, 
we find that sunlight strongly protects against getting influenza. Those are their words in their conclusion. Where does some of this also shine light on our understanding of the Spanish flu, the famous Spanish flu that we know killed so many people? Yeah. And one of the old pandemics that people talk about. Yeah, it was interesting. People who were sick and uh, and they put them uh, you know, obviously inside the hospitals, but they ran out of room. They started noticing that those people that were put outside actually um, had better recovery, kind of accidental. But they they knew at the time that there were a number of things that they were doing that were beneficial. So it wasn't like they were completely unaware that sunlight was not beneficial. Let me give you uh, sort of a, a mindset at the time. This is before antibiotics. This is before they understood a lot of, of, of medications and their benefits. And what the thinking was, what the state of the art thinking was at the time of the 1918-1919 influenza pandemic was that sunlight and fresh air were very important in people getting better. Uh, at the time, probably the largest hospital in the world was the Battle Creek Sanitarium run by John Harvey Kellogg. He had a lot of experience in what these uh, what these type of modalities were because he learned them from the Europeans. He went actually over to Austria. He learned from Rolier, high altitude sanitariums, tuberculosis, um, ultraviolet light. He actually came back and built these light boxes that he could use at sea level there in Battle Creek, Michigan. And uh, and so this was sort of the thought. This is this uh, the thought leaders of the world went to John Harvey Kellogg's Battle Creek Sanitarium to get better. So we're talking about Henry Ford. We're talking about uh, presidents of the United States, Warren G. Harding. We're talking about D Delano Roosevelt. We're talking about Amelia Earhart. These were uh, we're talking about Kettering. These are people that went for the best medical care, and this was the best at the time. In fact, the, the Nobel Prize in medicine in 1927 went to Julius Wagner Joreg for his use of heating up the body to cure people of neurosyphilis. This is a disease that today we give penicillin for. Back then, they were able to cure this disease simply by uh, inducing fever in patients. He actually used malaria to do this and then cured the malaria. They actually had the treatment for malaria at the time. Uh, but this is the thinking of what was going on, and and people started to do this. Now, when uh, when the pandemic came around, the army hospitals had just got their hands on aspirin. Now, aspirin was invented in 1899. It was discovered in 1899 by Bayer Aspirin. It was a German company, and obviously, during World War One, we were fighting the Germans, and uh, they were using aspirin in high doses. Why? Because they thought that it was the fever. It was the pain, it was the chills that was causing patients to die of influenza. And we found very clearly that aspirin gets rid of fevers. Aspirin is actually an analgesic. And so they were dosing aspirin at very high levels. And unfortunately, people were dying off. I think the case fatality rate was about 6%, which is, which is much about six times higher than COVID. And so interestingly, in the, uh, in the Northeast, there was a group of sanitariums similar to the Battle Creek Sanitarium. It was run by a guy by the name of, uh, one of them was run by the name of Dr. Wells Rubel. He later became the president of what's now known as Loma Linda University. And uh, they had a different take on, on how to treat these patients in these sanitariums. And he, instead of giving them aspirin and, and medications to bring down the fever, they actually did the opposite. They, they encouraged the fever. They got patients outside into the sunlight. They, they did hydrotherapy on them, which is in, in the sense, heating up their body with hot water to induce a fever. And uh, he actually wrote this up in, a, in an article that he published in May of 1919, looking at what the results were from hospitalization at the army hospitals versus what they experienced in these 10 sanitariums in the Northeast of the United States. And the difference was that a lot of the patients that were at the army hospitals went on to develop pneumonia. And of course, this is pre-antibiotic era. And uh, about 50% of those patients died. Whereas in the sanitariums, 
A very small percentage went on to develop pneumonia, but when they did, again, about 50% of those patients died. So the key was preventing pneumonia. And one of the things that is, is very important very early in uh, COVID-19 and influenza uh, therapy is the innate immune system. We now know that that is re regulated by interferon and that interferon is increased by hydrotherapy and increasing uh, uh, heat. So I think what looking back at that, what we know now, what Wells Rubel reported in his in his uh, in his article, that uh, the the this, the thing that was actually beneficial there was sunlight, fresh air, hydrotherapy. These are the things that was practiced in these sanitariums, and none of those things, by the way, require a, a supply chain. So it could be available today, even in the worst type of pandemic where we have no supply chain. You know, a huge part of what I'm walking away from the conversation so far and following your work is that. Anything that people are struggling with in our modern day society, especially the top killers of individuals, cardiovascular diseases, metabolic diseases like diabetes, cognitive decline, right? Even things like cancers, which we haven't gotten to yet, but we will. Those things are influenced by a lot of different factors. Genetics plays a role, a much tinier role than we're understanding than ever before, right? But it can play a role, but a tinier role. Our food plays a role, our nutrition plays a role, uh, our exercise, we're understanding that exercise is literally one of the best drugs that we have and it's completely free for us. And now we're adding to that conversation that sunlight and the challenge with sunlight though for a lot of people, and I hope the audience can see this in themselves because I had to see this in myself, is that we all think that we are getting more of it than we probably actually are. So anything that you're suffering from, mitochondria is involved in every cell in the body. Mitochondria thrive when we have regular sun exposure. And because we're so chronically deficient of the sun, the things that we would normally be suffering from are made so much more worse through lack of sunlight. That's my understanding. Have I missed any gaps inside of that? YouTube, if you enjoyed what you just saw, Keep watching for more great content on how to improve your brain and your life. If you're exposed to sunlight between six or seven o'clock in the morning till about seven or eight or nine o'clock at night, there was a definite reduction in mortality over 12 years.